Hello, and welcome to the 2020 Sagan Summer Workshop presentation on calibration sources for extreme precision radial velocity detection of exoplanets. My name is Stephanie Leifert, and I'm a technologist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Today, I'm going to tell you about the various instruments astronomers use to provide the wavelength solutions for EPRV spectrographs. So let's get started. Here's an overview of what we'll cover. First, we'll review why these instruments are necessary. Then we'll discuss the characteristics of a good PRV spec calibration source. Next, we'll take a look at what methods of spectrograph calibration have been done in the past and how well they performed. We'll follow that up with a description of what astronomers are using now, how they work, and the capabilities of each of these instruments. We'll finish up with a description of possible solutions for future EPRV calibration source needs. So let's start with why these instruments are necessary. Let's quickly review the signal we're looking at and how we get it. We observe the spectrum of an exoplanet hosting star, typically using a cross dispersed to shell spectrograph. We see motion of the star's spectral features on the spectrograph's detector due to the star's Doppler shift. But we want to measure that motion relative to what? We need a reference against which to measure it, a spectral ruler, if you will, one that measures on an angstrom scale. And it's got to be at least an order of magnitude more stable than the stellar lines. The challenges, in addition to assuring that level of stability, are getting the grid of lines you want at the right line spacing across the full instrument bandpass. The motion of the stellar lines on the spectrograph will be a combination of the actual Doppler shift and tiny motions in the spectrograph itself measured with the calibration source. So you have to subtract out the latter quantity to get your RV signal. The calibration source is useful for something else just as important. See, long before your spectrograph can be used for RV measurements, you have to test it to see how stable it is and to determine whether environmental or operational factors, you know, things like liquid nitrogen refills on the instrument cryostat, for example, or mechanical motions due to any number of reasons are causing drifts. So it's a great diagnostic tool. Thus far, we haven't talked about the size of these wavelength shifts. Well, for an exoplanet, an exo-Earth orbiting in the habitable zone of a sun-like star, the radial velocity signature is around nine centimeters per second. And that means we're talking about three parts in 10 billion. And just to put that further into perspective, here's a micrograph of a silicon wafer lattice, the material typically used for CCD detectors like those in PRV spectrographs with the image scale being one one thousandth of a pixel. And you'll note that nine centimeter per second radial velocity corresponds to a motion on the detector of roughly five atoms across. Now I stole this chart from Sam, chart from Sam Halverson, who used it in his presentation on instrumental challenges for the precision radial velocity method at the 2018 Sagan Summer Workshop. You can see a recording of his full presentation at the link in the reference. Okay, so let's move on to what makes a good EPRB spectrograph calibration source. Good calibration sources have to offer spectral coverage across the full wavelength range of interest. In the context of EPRV and the search for exo-Earths, that means looking in the part of the spectrum where you find the peak of those stars emission on the visible band. And we also know that stellar activity results in an RV signal, but less so in the infrared portion of the spectrum. So, Observing in the near IR might help to decouple the uh, stellar activity signal from the achromatic Doppler signal. By way of example, the NUID spectrograph has spectral coverage from 380 nanometers through 930. Next, we want our calibration source to have a dense, uniform grid of lines. But how far apart should they be? Well, that's a function of the resolution of the spectrograph. We don't want the lines so dense that we can't resolve them but we also want the free spectral range small enough so as to have a line close to every potential spectral feature. So here's a chart showing an analysis of the impact on RV precision of the calibration line spacing on a spectrograph with resolution of 150,000, which is about what you'd want for an EPRV spectrograph. 
The inset shows that when integrated over the wavelength range of the simulated spectrum, which is 380 nanometers to 820 nanometers here, roughly 10 gigahertz line spacing is about optimal. At 500 nanometers, that's about 120 lines per nanometer. From a completely pragmatic standpoint, most folks don't have high resolution visible band spectrometers sitting around in their labs. So if you are in the business of developing these calibration sources, what you'll find is that most commercial visible band optical spectrum analyzers don't have resolution that good. So for diagnostic and development purposes, you're actually better off at line spacings between 25 and 30 gigahertz. And you can see from the chart that the RV precision impact is pretty minimal. So going back to our drawing, how bright should your calibration lines be? Well, they should match the intensity of the stellar spectrum. If they're brighter, they can saturate the detector, and that causes problems with centroiding the calibration line. If they're too dim, then the SNR is lower. So from a practical standpoint, you want a calibration source that provides lines at least as bright as the brightest star you intend to observe, and the ability to attenuate it to match your actual target star. That turns out to be on the order of a picojoule, as it allows for attenuation through various other components in the optical train. Furthermore, you'd like intensity uniformity across the full band pass. As you don't want the intensity of your calibration lines to vary in time. How narrow do the lines have to be? Well, not very. Chances are, your spectrograph will never be able to resolve the line width of your calibration lines. For example, the line width of the espresso spectrographs at Edelon calibration source, which we'll talk about later, is well over a gigahertz. It ranges from 2.7 gigahertz at the red end at 780 nanometers to five gigahertz at the blue end at 380 nanometers and has a corresponding line spacing of two to seven times the line width, just so long as the centroid of that line isn't moving. And speaking of not moving, you want the centroid of your lines to be stable to better than three times 10 to the minus 11 or one centimeter per second. Well, how do you get frequency stability that good? <laughs> Fortunately, in the modern, modern era, it's just not that hard. This is a chart made by Scott Didims at the National Institute of Standards and Technology from a paper he wrote in 2004 for the journal Science on Time and Frequency Standards. You can see that one centimeter, one centimeter per second RV precision corresponds to a clock uncertainty right about here. Note the scale is in seconds per day. There are commercially available atomic clocks that can provide us the precision we need if we can just reference them. And we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Just a note on intensity stability. This is a time-lapse movie of one calibration line on the Palomar radial velocity instrument which is a PRV spectrograph operating in the near IR. It shows you what can happen if the intensity changes over time. The X in the image marks the centroid. You can see that over time it appears to shift. Intensity fluctuations can manifest in detector effects in which the size of the detector point spread function decrease, increases with brightness, and this is called the brighter fatter effect. Okay, time to actually talk about real calibration sources. Now that I've shown you what makes a good EPR, EPRV calibration source, let's talk about what tools astronomers have used to calibrate their PRV spectrographs. A major workhorse of PRV calibration has been thorium argon emission lamps. Another method is to use gas cells to make use of atomic or molecular absorption features. In this case, the starlight passes through the cell and the calibration lines are overlaid with the starlight. Next, Fabry Pro etalons are the calibration source of choice concurrent with observations on multiple PRV instruments, including NUID, Espresso, and Maroon X. Let's talk about each of these techniques in more detail. First, we'll talk about emission lamps. Thorium argon emission lamps have been a real workhorse in the astronomy community. They've been widely used on almost all ground-based spectrographs on astronomical telescopes for wavelength calibration. The reasons are that they provide copious spectral features across the visible band, and we can be pretty confident that atomic transitions don't change. They're also straightforward and easy to use. However, in recent years, there's been growing difficulty with the availability of good thorium argon emission lamps. And by that, I mean that the cathodes are now made with thorium oxide. That produces undesirable spectral features, sometimes referred to as grass, that compromises wavelength calibration. 
Also, the spectrum changes as the lamps age and the emission lines are irregularly spaced. Furthermore, there aren't any conventional emission lamps that provide adequate calibration in the near IR. The best RV precision achieved to date with thorium argon lamps is on the order of a meter per second. You can see on the thorium argon spectrum shown here, the differing intensity across the orders. You see two different channels here. Normally, one is used for the lamp and the other for starlight to do simultaneous calibration. A quick note about simultaneous calibration. When the calibration light passes through a fiber that's adjacent to the science fiber, you're calibrating the pixels that are offset from the science spectrum. So that has to be taken into account and is another good argument for using an ultra stable spectrograph. Another calibration technique that eliminates concern about simultaneous calibration on separate fibers is to use gas cells. In this case, your starlight passes through a gas and the absorption features are imprinted directly on your spectrum. Iodine gas cells are the tool of choice in the visible band. The drawbacks are that you lose some of your science light and there's only a little more than 100 nanometers of your spectral coverage. Also, when you superimpose the, impose this iodine spectrum, you can mask line profile variations that result from stellar activity, which makes it difficult to correct. Gas cells with, for example, methane are also used in near IRPRV. So let's move on to fabry perot etalons. These instruments are currently deployed on multiple PRV spectrographs for simultaneous calibration. The uppermost picture is of an etalon used on NUID, and the right-hand picture shows the Maroon X etalon and its vacuum vessel. Etalons are relatively simple white light illuminated optical devices consisting of parallel plates coated with a reflective material and separated by a small fixed distance. When light hits one of the surfaces, some of it's transmitted out and part is reflected back. If the opt extra optical path length of the reflected beam is an integral multiple of the wavelength, then the reflected beams constructively interfere so the transmitted light varies periodically with the optical frequency. The result is a comb of quasi-periodic lines with the line position set by physical parameters, like etalon spacer thickness. However, you can get frequency drifts for many different reasons in passively stabilized FP etalons, including aging of materials like the zero-door spacers and vacuum gap etalons, long-term degradation of the dielectric mirror coatings that form the resonator, changing environmental conditions and temperature and pressure, and as changes in the illumination, specifically the thermal mechanical stability of the light injection. Some of these changes can result in wavelength dependent drift of the calibration spectrum. Etalons require exquisite thermal stability in order to maintain a stable spectrum, and they inherently rely on an external reference for absolute accuracy. Some etalons are stabilized to a wavelength reference like a rubidium transition around 780 nanometers. But when you reference an etalon at one wavelength, the stability of lines far from that point are not assured. Nevertheless, these devices have been engineered to provide RV precision at the level of one to three centimeters per second over days. On the right hand side of this chart are calibration spectra from the HARP spectrograph using an etalon calibrator in two channels. In the lower panel, one of the fiber channels is illuminated with a thorium argon lamp instead. And this gives you a clearer picture of the paucity and non-uniformity of lines from the emission lamp. The chart on the left shows an Allen deviation curve, a measure of the frequency stability of the Maroon X etalon lines shown on the previous chart. One issue that has to be compensated for in these devices made with ultra low expansion material like Zerador is that there is a slow but steady drift from material aging that has to be corrected. These are great calibrators for short-term use, and their slow predictable drift can be characterized with other frequency wavelength references on time scales of weeks to months. It's also fair to say that the limits of engineering etalons to greater frequency stability has not been fully explored. But what can you use to calibrate an etalon? Well, you want something more stable than it. And for that, we have the optical frequency comb. The rest of this talk is going to be about optical frequency combs. Combs allow us to achieve calibration precision at levels below a centimeter per second. Combs are a class of new devices that have emerged over the last couple of decades. We're gonna talk about several of these and their suitability as calibrators for EPRV spectrographs. First, we'll talk about mode locked laser combs, of which there's a commercially available product called the Astro Comb, pictured in the top center. Then we'll talk about other combs composed of components originally designed for the optical telecommunications industry. These are called electro-optic modulation combs. The habitable planet finders EOM comb is shown at the bottom center. 
And then we'll talk about the forefront of comb research and technology with microcombs, which are tiny chip scale optical resonators that exploit nonlinear optical phenomena to produce combs. We'll start the <clears throat> with the mode lock laser combs. Suppose you have a laser cavity and through constructive and destructive interference in that cavity, you wind up with a pulse where all the modes are locked in phase to generate a short pulse once every round trip time of the laser cavity. That's a mode locked laser. And the spectrum of its pulse train looks like a series of Dirac delta functions separated by the repetition rate, which is just the inverse of the round trip time of the laser light. It looks like a comb of lines in frequency space. Typical pulse repetition rates in mode lock lasers like this are around 100 to 200 megahertz, where the mode spacing is set by the length of the cavity. The pulse width on these combs are on the order of femtoseconds, corresponding to hundreds of nanometers of spectral coverage. A real breakthrough came when John Hall and Theodore Hanch took an octave spanning mode locked laser comb, frequency doubled the red end of it, heterodyned it with the blue end, and used the beat note to stabilize the comb frequency. It's called self referencing. The repetition rate can be locked to an RF reference, like the cesium clocks we referred to in an earlier slide. And there you have a fully stabilized, phase coherent comb with stability tied to the SI definition of a second. In 2005, Hall and Hans shared half of the Nobel Prize in physics for this optical frequency comb technique. Frequency combs are sometimes called an optical clockwork because they enable you to relate an optical frequency standard to an electronic one. They are truly the ultimate optical ruler. One of the inventors, Ted Hanch, started up a company called Menlo Systems, and they started building frequency combs for the purpose of calibrating astronomical spectrographs and dubbed this calibrator the Astrocomb. But there's something they had to do first. You see, the line spacing in mode lock laser combs is too dense on the order of 100 to 200 megahertz, whereas you recall that we need comb spacings of 10 to 30 gigahertz. So Menlo Systems had to engineer the Astrocomb with a series of three Fabry-Perot filter cavities to throw away most of the lines. There are now Menlo Astrocombs at a number of observatories supporting, supporting PRV observations, including Express and NUID, and there is simply no better calibrator in terms of stability than a self-reference laser comb. But unfortunately, the lifetime of one of the Astrocomb components, a nonlinear optical fiber that's used to broaden the comb spectrum, is not that great. It needs to be replaced fairly often, and it's expensive. So that's a problem. In the meantime, it turns out that there are other ways to make frequency combs. One way, which makes use of commercially available optical telecon equipment, is the electro-optic modulation frequency comb. You can follow along in the diagram here, but the idea is to start with a pump laser, typically at either one or 1 1.5 microns, and send that light through a series of cascaded phase modulators, which put sidebands on the pump frequency spaced by the modulation frequency. That modulation frequency is set by an oscillator. In this diagram, it's a 12 gigahertz oscillator. Then the light goes through an intensity modulator driven at the same frequency that carves out pulses. We lock the drive oscillator to a GPS disciplined rubidium clock, and that keeps the repetition rate, or the comb line spacing, really stable. Now we have what we call a mini comb. It's only a few nanometers wide at this point, up to about 10 nanometers wide. We do some pulse conditioning, amplify the mini comb in a fiber amplifier, and spectrally broaden it in either highly nonlinear fiber or a specially engineered nonlinear waveguide. And voila, we have a comb. There has been success in broadening EO combs to an octave to self-reference them, but for the job they need to do at an observatory, it can be sufficient to reference the pump laser to either an atomic or molecular transition, or to another self-reference frequency comb that has perhaps too dense a line spacing, but is a good frequency reference. The beauty of EO combs is that they're relatively inexpensive, robust, you can set the line spacing where you want it in the first place, between 10 and 30 gigahertz, and you have so much optical power that there is a great deal of margin if, for example, your comb light needs to go through an integrating sphere at the observatory when coupled to your spectrograph. There are EO combs in operation at the Habitable Planet Finder instrument at the Hobby Eberle Telescope. That one has been running nearly continuously for two years and provides calibration light between 800 and 1300 nanometers and the Palomar Radio Velocity instrument from 1200 to 1800 nanometers. There's another one at the Subaru Telescope's Radio Velocity instrument on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. All of these instruments, you'll note, are on infrared spectrographs. No one has made a visible band EO comb that I know of. We tried and it didn't work out so well. 
So eocombs work, won't work for EPRV unless we are successful in broadening them all the way down into the visible, the blue visible, or frequency doubling them. And that's quite challenging, but people are trying. This is a cartoon of the habitable planet finder 30 gigahertz line spacing eocomb layout and its spectrum. It operates by the same principles I showed you on the last slide, but there are a couple of important and notable features. First of all, the nonlinear spectral broadening in this comb is accomplished with a specially engineered silicon nitride waveguide that allows you to achieve a nice smooth comb intensity profile, better than you can get with highly nonlinear fiber. However, it's free space coupled with the beam, and that makes setup for long-term operation a bit more complex. Also note the large dynamic range of the comb intensity. As you know from those images of thorium argon lines, you want uniform intensity across the full band pass, and that means you have to flatten the comb spectrum. And the way we do that is with a spectral flattener like this. Spectral flatteners are part of astrocomb systems that break up the comb spectrum into channels and selectively attenuate the light with the use of liquid crystal and silicon spatial light modulators. You can rotate the polarization of light in each pixel on the SLM by an amount determined by an applied voltage, and then by passing the light through a polarizer, you shape your comb intensity profile. At the left here is a diagram of a reflective SLM spectral flattener design. And on the right is a breadboard setup of a spectral flattener for the Palomar radial velocity instrument with the SLM near the center of the image. There are other spectral flattening schemes around using combinations of static optical filters or arrayed waveguide gratings, but we won't go into that here. Finally, there is a great deal of new research and development in another kind of frequency comb that we'll talk about now. These are microcombs. Another class of frequency combs is based on tiny, high quality factor resonant cavities called microcombs. High quality factor means the resonators are able to effectively confine light with very little loss as it propagates around in the cavity. These devices can be rings or discs composed of silica, silicon nitride, aluminum nitride, crystals like magnesium fluoride or calcium fluoride, and even diamond. The movie on the right illustrates, getting the movie going there, the process of comb formation in resonators. When you pump one of the resonator cavities with a single input frequency, two new frequencies, one higher and one lower, are created. This is a process called degenerate four-way of mixing. All these new frequencies of light appear in the resonator. And they'll interact with the original pump light and among themselves through non-degenerate four-way mixing to create even more optical frequencies. This cascade of frequency forms microcombs, also called Kerr combs that are essentially the equivalent of a mode lock laser used in a conventional frequency comb. Originally, there was difficulty in getting stable comb formation in these resonators, but a few years back, folks figured out how to form solitons in the microcombs. Their solitons are wave packets that maintain their shape while propagating around the cavity. Solitons are caused by a balancing of nonlinear and dispersive effects in the resonator medium. And that's important because it's led to the stable comb operation that we can use for astrocombs. There's presently a lot of work going on to try to self-reference these microcombs, but so far they haven't achieved octave span for mode spacings appropriate for astrocombs. The mode spacing is set by the size of the resonator, and so they can be built to have the free spectral range we want for astrocombs. They're small and therefore have the potential application in myriad commercial products, but also potentially for spaceflight in case we should ever want to do PRV in space. We took a soliton microcomb to Keck Observatory and demonstrated it on the near spec spectrograph. Here's a picture of the resonator package in the upper left of the comb spectrum and the instrument layout on the right and the comb lines as they appear on near spec. You'll notice we didn't bother to flatten the spectrum, so there's a large dynamic range. So, where do we go from here? There's a lot of exciting work going on with microcombs. For example, the image on the right hand side is from a recent Nature paper on what they're calling a turnkey soliton microcomb. Turnkey because literally all you need to do is turn on the laser power and the soliton forms and self locks for stable operation. You get the idea it would be great to replace a full instrument rack and optical bench with one of these devices. We're also investigating a different kind of etalon shown on the left side. Instead of the parallel plate variety of Fabry Pro etalons we talked about earlier, these devices also use optical resonators. Instead of the reflective surfaces being a mirror coating like on standard etalons, the reflection is formed by the dielectric air interface. 
Light is coupled in and out of the resonator through a pair of prisms, and the etalon mode spacing is set by the geometry of the cavity. The real trick with this kind of etalon, which is submillimeter scale, is to sandwich in between material of opposite thermal expansion to constrain mechanical expansion. These etalons can be stabilized by a low repetition rate foam referenced laser, and so are a kind of hybrid concept. So in summary, EPRV calibration sources are a critical enabling component of radial velocity instruments for detection and characterization of Earth-sized exoplanets in the habitable zone of sun-like stars. But make no mistake, achieving nine centimeter per second RV precision over years is an enormous technical challenge and requires calibration sources at the cutting edge of technology. Optical frequency combs represent the gold standard of calibration sources and can provide the frequency stability and line density we need but are still not reliably available at wavelengths blue of 500 nanometers. Furthermore, optical etalon technology has not yet been pushed to its limits and still holds promise for EPRV applications. Thank you for listening. <laughs>